Thanks for downloading this episode from Teachers Talk Radio. You can find the full schedule and listen back to all our shows at ttradio.org. Enjoy the podcast. This programme has been brought to you by The Happy Confident Company. Our clinically approved, ready-to-go wellbeing and mental health programme will help your pupils thrive. In only 10 minutes a day, you'll be able to deliver social and emotional learning and wellbeing tools throughout your school. To find out more, visit us at www.happyconfident.com. It's time for a fresh start to language learning. Pearson Edexcel's new student-centred French, German and Spanish 2024 GCSEs cater to the needs of all learners, regardless of their background, ability or reason for studying. Rooted in learned language knowledge, their assessments are transparent and accessible, allowing all students to showcase their language skills. Through inclusive and relatable content, the new Pearson Edexcel MFL GCSEs build a shared cultural capital that helps students develop an understanding of and appreciation for the wider world. Find out more at go.pearson.com forward slash MFL GCSE 24. Hello, good evening and welcome to Teachers Talk Radio, The Late Show with me, Tom Rogers. Uh, Massive thank you if you're listening back to this and you've just started listening. Thanks for giving up your next 90 minutes to listen to this fascinating show all about how to be a successful teacher of the deaf. Now, the reason that I've decided to embark on this little journey is because in January I myself um, started to teach for the very first time in a um, special school for the deaf Um, and it's been a really revealing experience for me Um, and much to my own sort of detriment really uh, it was a world that I didn't really consider existed i mean I, I i was just completely after working in what eight nine different schools prior to that and actually you come into an environment where stuff is happening that you've never seen before and actually there was a little bit of sadness in there for me as well in the sense that i feel like the teachers the community the kids and everybody else involved in schools like this um, deserve much more attention uh, maybe than they 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 get uh, on a national level on a on a uh, even on a regional level um so there's a few reasons for this show um one of them is a purely selfish one because i i'm trying to to teach in a school for the deaf so this is a new thing for me i haven't learned any sign yet um i haven't sort of really deeply considered my own practice so this is going to be great for me to talk to my two guests tonight about how to become a better teacher of the deaf and how to understand what it is that you have to do to become a teacher of the deaf um so we're going to explore a heck of a lot tonight um we're basically going to explore probably the content of um a degree at Manchester University in in how to be a teacher of the deaf in podcast form, which should be interesting. But um, certainly it's going to be fantastic because in a minute I'm, I'm going to introduce my two guests who have experience. Uh, both um, are teachers of the deaf. Um, both have plentiful experience of, of doing that. So it's going to be really insightful to hear from them in a moment. Before I introduce them, it would be an excellent moment for me to mention our two special sponsors on this show. The first one is Pearson MFL, uh, which is Modern Foreign Languages. If you haven't heard the show from last week, uh, exploring the gap in cultural capital in language learning, then I would highly recommend going on to Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from and clicking on that show hosted by Darren Lester. Um, Pearson Edexcel's new student centre French, German, Spanish 2024 GCSEs cater to the needs of all learners regardless of their background ability or reason for studying they are rooted in learned language knowledge as we found out in the show 
um, and their assessments are transparent, accessible, and allow all students to showcase their language skills through inclusive and relatable content. If you want to find out more about Pearson MFL's new GCSE units, then go to go.pearson.com forward slash MFL. That's go.pearson.com forward slash MFL. Our other sponsor tonight is the Happy Confident Company, and I'm going to be telling you a little bit more about them later on. If you're listening live and you want to find out more about our sponsors, you can click into the pin messages at the top of the space. Um, I'm going to firstly ask Ryan to unmute himself, and we'll just check he's with us. Hi, Good Tom. evening. How are you, sir? I'm good, thank you. How Excellent, are you? Not too bad. Um, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your story as to how you became a teacher of the deaf? Uh, yeah, so uh, my name's Ryan Brewer. Um, how did I become a teacher of the deaf? Um, probably like many teachers of the deaf currently, uh, my my life in teaching started in, in mainstream primary Um where I taught for several years, um, year five and six only, uh, really was my kind of specialty. And then I was really lucky that I got a, a little boy with um, Down syndrome came into my class one year, who um, was just an absolute delight. Um, but um, he had hearing loss and um, his peripatetic teacher of the deaf um, came in to visit um, and introduced herself. I'd never heard of a teacher of the deaf. I didn't know they existed. And, and at this point, I was already five years into my teaching career and kind of was like, oh, what do you do? Um, and had a chat with her and just found it quite interesting. And then, um, yeah, I got more inquisitive, started had a, having a look into it. I'd, I'd actually done my PGC over at Manchester anyway and then realised that they had a course. So I... Um, decided eventually um i was on the route to kind of more senior leadership in in primary and decided that probably wasn't for me i like being in the classroom a bit more so decided to to go down the um the master's route at manchester um had a rip my, my school were really supportive they they kind of support me through that allowed me to go part-time so i could do it and then i've been at my current school for three or four years now yeah um which is a school for a through school for deaf children um and i absolutely love it and i wouldn't I haven't looked back since fantastic and full disclosure myself and ryan are colleagues in this particular school we won't name the school <clears throat> but um it's a fantastic school great place to work um and um you know and it, i'm really excited to have you on ryan because you know from a distance the work you do is is phenomenal so that's that's really amazing to to be able to talk to you tonight on this um so you've sort of I, oh, before i ask ryan any more questions i also have karina karina can you introduce yourself please hi um yeah my name's karina and i am a peripatetic teacher of the deaf my history or coming to teach the deaf is actually quite similar to ryan i was a primary school teacher for nearly 19 years and had a wide range of experience across all year groups from early years through to year six. And as a primary school teacher, I felt like a bit of a jack of all trades, but a master of none. So I decided <laughs> that I really wanted to explore becoming a specialist in something. And that's mm. sort of how I came to be in a teacher of the deaf. I I investigated different opportunities, particularly within SEND, which was a particular area of interest. Um, one of my ex-colleagues had become a qualified teacher of the vision impaired. So I had a chat with her. And from that chat, so my journey to becoming a teacher of the deaf started. Um, I joined the authority that I'm currently at. And I did my qualification at Birmingham University. And six years down the line, I still love my job. Wow, fantastic. Um, right, I, I want to sort of, there's a heck of a lot that I want to get through this evening, but I thought a really nice place to start would be to talk a little bit about the students that you both teach. Um, so, Ryan, maybe starting with yourself, um, what what are the students' sort of levels of, of hearing loss? Um 
and how does that impact their learning and and what are the implications um of deafness on sort of cognitive and social and emotional development what what are your students like apart from obviously being wonderful people um, yeah, so um, at, at our school, um, most of the pupils are um, at least moderately, uh, have a moderate hearing loss all the way through to profound. So we have probably a large majority of, of our profound. Um, that being said, you know, because we're in 2023, um, lots of our pupils have got cochlear implants or, or really half decent hearing aids but then we have quite a number of pupils who who, who are steiners who who can't access that technology as well so we've got a real real mix of children um in terms of how does it affect their their learning and social emotional kind of stuff um really it's that classic of uh, of of hearing loss it, it's their it's their language delay and language deprivation that, that's the key to it all really yeah. so because of their hearing loss their language is is just behind that of, of their hearing peers, um, and and that obviously then has a huge impact upon everything really, because uh, as as you know, if you actually really think about it, you know, and I've, I've explained this many times to friends and, and other you know ex colleagues, language underpins everything that we do from learning to how we relate to other people, how we understand other people, how we get along with other people. It, it just impacts everything. So for deaf children, um, especially the deaf children at our school, that language learning is is not only delayed, but just takes that little bit longer. Um, so that means that, you know, that we, we work at a, sometimes a slower pace or, or slightly behind where the children are in terms of chronological age. Um, but at the same time, it's it's fun, fantastic because we, we really work to, to fill those gaps, if that makes sense. Yeah, that absolutely does. Um, it, it is, a, and we're going to sort of dig into the pedagogy behind it um, a lot more in the next sort of hour or so. Um, Karina, I don't know whether you've got anything you want to add there to what Ryan said. I absolutely fundamentally agree with absolutely everything Ryan has said, particularly about that those language levels. I think for a peripatetic teacher, we experience children we have a lot more variety of children so we work from newborn diagnosis so some of our children can be up to 12 weeks old and the eldest young person on my caseload is 19 so that's a huge huge range um and we we support any child with a hearing loss so we go from mild unilateral losses all the way through to profound as well with the whole range of hearing amplification do you, do you think that I mean, again, this is this is me coming in really from that sort of ignorant perspective in, in the sense of, like, I, you know, up until January, I, I didn't know anything about mm-hmm. this. But do, how do you think deafness impacts the... Because we've talked about, like, the cognitive, social and emotional development. Yeah, we, we understand. But how does it actually impact... Does it impact their personality makeup does it does it make them more resilient does it make them more you know are are the sort of traits that you know I mean does does that play into it at all I think it fundamentally does our deaf children particularly in mainstream children are often the only deaf child within that school so they have to be really resilient in the way that they try and keep up with their peers at times, particularly in noisy classrooms, in a mainstream classroom. They are such noisy places and rightly so. So those are deaf pupils really need to find ways of overcoming that and whether that's be- they become very resilient and very good at advocating for themselves, standing up for themselves, telling that teacher off when they need to, or asking their friends, can we go somewhere quiet to listen? They really learn about their deafness. They are the absolute experts in their deafness. And in a mainstream school where they're often the only deaf child, they are the people that need to advocate for themselves. And that's something we really do try and support and teach them. Yeah. I mean, with your role, are you sort of going into schools and helping specific children partly yeah my, the role's huge we with a 12-week-old baby we're going in and supporting families so we're getting to yeah. 
basically we're giving the families that information that they need so that they can make informed decisions about where their child's journey is going to go, whether that's a sign route, whether that's an amplification route, whether it's a bit of both. And taking forwards whether they're going to go to a specialist focus provision or specialist desk school going on. And then when our young people hit education at nursery or at school, we are then there to support the staff who often, I in yeah. years, had never encountered a child with a no. So for empowering those that staff and that staff team and that whole school to embrace deafness, to learn about it and to be able to support it and to support the access for that pupil, but also to support the other children in the class and to support that deaf young person within that mainstream. Some young people will need additional support from myself as a teacher of the deaf. So we might offer weekly one-on-one teaching sessions to yeah. really help them to close the gap. Other young people maybe need a check on their amplification every six weeks or so and to check in with them to check everything's okay to check on learning levels to check on social emotional mental health there's there's a whole wide range of support then that we offer those young people in education yeah spot on um ryan i mean i know i asked karina there about this sort of issue not issue but this sort of idea of um sort of common traits in the students because you've obviously worked in well you've both worked in that mainstream setting You've then come in to become teachers of the deaf. And Ryan, you now work in a, in, in a special school, one special school specifically. Have you noticed any sort of common threads or traits? You know, are there any sort of common characteristics that you think are different when it comes to the, the group or not? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think similar to Karina, the children are, are really, really resilient in, in many ways um, because they, they have to advocate for themselves. Um, and, um, you know, because they, they might be the only deaf person in their in their um, in their house or in their local community. On the flip side, uh, where I work is a little bit different because because all the children in the school are, are deaf. Um, they can almost, on the flip side of what Karina said, can almost be in a little bit of a bubble sometimes. And and that's a re- obviously has massive positives. It's a really great mm. thing. But at the same time, that can mean that kind of the the reality of of, of kind of the mainstream setting, and we, we do have children leaving our kind of primary um, age group going off into into uh, secondary mainstream they can find that tricky because of, you know, they've got to deal with, as Karina said, a noisier classroom, um, a bigger classroom, lots of things like that. So, you know, it's got its positives and negatives, but certainly I would, I would completely agree with Karina that, you know, on the whole, a lot of deaf children are incredibly resilient because they're just working all the time to either working that bit harder to kind of stay on, uh, stay in touch with their, their hearing peers and also advocate for themselves. Yeah. I mean, um, what I want to get into next, so we've sort of established, okay, you know, um, we, we've established that, that there are groups of deaf children, whether in mainstream or whether in special schools. We've talked a little bit there about the, the sort of um, the impact of deafness on their cognitive and social and emotional development. I mean, I want to sort of just before we move on from there, Karina, the social side of it, um, how, how would you say? it impacts their social development um you know specifically i think for deaf people and deaf young children when they're in the only school and they are the only deaf deaf child in that class or in that school i think socially and emotionally some children can find that really really difficult they see themselves as different and they don't understand why they're different and they often crave to meet other deaf young people um yeah in the authority that i work in we are really proud that we actually offer social opportunities in holidays where deaf young people can get together do something fun but they can just be themselves and they can compare what's it like in your class or this is what happens to me and having that time to be able to talk to socialize to make friends and to know that they're not the only deaf person in that local community is really important. One of my big roles as well is to to share with families other social opportunities for them to to take part in with our charity partners. 
or um, with the National Deaf Children's Society, just to try and get people linking together so they've got a network of support. I think there are 18 specialist deaf schools around the country, something around that. It may be 23, actually. It's either 18 or 23. Um, Are there enough specialist schools? Because presumably there aren't, so therefore some students have to go to mainstream and are supported by someone like you, Karina. I think there are specialist deaf schools, but we also need to remember that within a lot of local authorities, there is also specialist focus provisions mm. within mainstream. So certainly in the authority that I work in, we have a primary and we have a secondary where deaf young people are educated within mainstream, but there is a teacher of the deaf on site supporting, providing that specialist intervention. And there is also that social peer group there that, that can get together. So There are definitely a massive need for deaf schools. There is a massive need for more teachers of the deaf. But the work that's going on in our local focus provisions is also really important. Let's move on. Um, Ryan, I want to talk to you about pedagogy. I want to talk to you about how is it different to be a teacher of the deaf than a mainstream teacher of a a primary or of a subject? Um, So... It, it's it's all those great traits of being a really good teacher obviously um but for me you know coming out of mainstream uh, mainstream and into a, a school for the deaf i think i certainly to to coin a fr- that phrase I, I live by the seat of my pants a lot more <laughs> and I, I mean that um in a, not not that i'm not organized but no. what i learned very quickly was was in in mainstream for example i could have a sequence of lessons planned for for quite a you know for a number of weeks ahead almost and I knew exactly what I'd be doing most days with the children and you know you'd fill those gaps you know where you needed to uh, and do some intervention groups and but you know etc cetera, etc cetera. however um I quickly realized that that doesn't work um with deaf children uh, the deaf children I teach um because you can have really high aspirations but your my expectation of getting to that is tempered back a little bit and and the reason for that is is because you know I I might expect that they will understand this piece of vocabulary but you know when we come across it in in a book that we're studying or or whatever or in maths we haven't got a clue we have to do a lot of work and go back over and back over and that you know can be as simple you know depending on the class but um can be as simple as, as prepositional language of you know, in front of, behind, you know, some th- things that probably most hearing people take for granted. Yeah. You have to go back and really, really kind of break it down and spend that time in it, which actually I really enjoy. I, I, that's one of the reasons it attracted me to the job. Um, yeah, so it's, certainly... it's a challenge. Like, I really enjoy, personally, me now, at the very beginning of this, for me, um, I really enjoyed the challenge side of it. I, I wonder whether I, I could guess that other teachers might um, see that as something they they maybe didn't want to do. You know, I can imagine some teachers I've worked with who would say, you know, no, actually, I, I want to just be able to 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 sort of teach the content and you know get straight into the content and really go t- straight away to that level. Um, whereas there's other teachers, and I would include myself in this bracket that. I don't get frustrated. I, I actually like that challenge and I see it as valuable um, for each child to be able to change what I'm doing and everything I've always done to, uh, to, to make it work. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, it's about it's it's very, you know, and obviously all, all teaching practice has got to be reflective, but it's that formative assessment is just absolutely massive. It's constantly looking at, have we understood this? Do we need to do this again? Do we need to do this differently? You know, what are the gaps? What are the gaps? What are the gaps? All, all the time, all the time, breaking it down, going slow and steady, doing less better, um, that kind of, that kind of thing. Um, and, and obviously, you know, massive, a massive emphasis. Oh, you've just gone a bit quiet, Ryan. Oh, sorry. I think I've just covered my microphone. Um, and, and obviously, a massive um, emphasis on, on visual um ways of ways of presenting things visually it is absolutely essential um but yeah it's certainly about just really knowing your subject matter well and being able to really break every little 
part of it down if you if you need to. Yeah, yeah. Um, Karina, in in terms of like, you know, I've already asked Ryan. You know, how is how is the pedagogy when teaching the deaf different? So you can certainly touch on that. But I was also going to ask you, you know, what are the communication modes that you use? So in terms of communication modes, all of the pupils that I support within mainstream, they are all oral. Um, All the families that I've supported through this have all chosen that that is the method of communication that would best support the pupil and the family. Although all of the families in the authority where I work are offered an introductory to sign. Okay. And they are also signposted to other sign lessons, which are free that they can access. Yeah. If... But does that mean that the... so does that mean that a lot of the students you work with are able to lip read? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Um, if a family chooses that sign language is the best option for them then we support them through either going to a focus provision school or going to a school for the deaf and that's where those teachers of the deaf would support that family and that child that child got you so um so why if they if they said yeah we want to go down the avenue of sign why would that then mean that they would then go to a school for the deaf School for the Deaf or a focus provision. Um, the focus provisions have staff who have got a good level of sign. Yeah. They have got teachers who have got an understanding of signs and can have got a good deaf awareness. Yeah. Um, so we've already got that training in place in our mainstream schools, as we've already spoken about. Very few mainstream teachers have ever experienced supporting a deaf child, let alone a deaf child signing. So that school would then need to fund a communication support worker. Yeah. They, they'd need somebody who's already got that level of sign. And those people to employ are very few and far between and very difficult to get hold of and also quite expensive. Yeah. And I'm not saying that our schools wouldn't do that, um, but that would need to be factored in. And we've, where we've already got schools that can offer that level of sign, our families will often choose those signs, those schools who can sign or would prefer to have a community where the child has got deaf peers and a community within that deaf community of the local area. Can you describe to me, Karina, like your tips? So some, you said that you mentioned that sometimes you work one to one with a student. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you, you presumably you work in maybe a class with them, you sit with them, you know, all different things. Can, can you sort of describe to me a typical day for you, <laughs> if there is such oh. a thing? There is no such typical day. Um, <laughs> one visit, I could be doing a home visit with a family and then going into a mainstream school to do some observation work mm. to observe a, a deaf pupil in the classroom and then to take them out and have a chat with them about how they feel their learning's going. Mm. We um, complete functional listening tests. We use a test box to check their amplification equipment is working optimally. If the pupil's using a radio aid, we check all of that equipment too. We talk to them about if there's anything that we can do to support them, what do they feel that they need? Um, We do a lot of preparation for adulthood. So thinking about their independent skills as a deaf young person, what is it that they need to do? What do they aspire to? What what career would they like? What would they like to be able to do when they're older? Where would they want to live? And what are the skills that they need to start thinking about that? And we start that quite early on. We also dig quite deeply and explore their social, emotional, mental well-being mm-hmm. um, within the class and within their their society as well. So we do all sorts yeah because there's almost sort of a counseling dimension there isn't there absolutely and particularly for if deaf teenagers are starting to find things a little tricky they are starting to question why they're deaf they sometimes feel quite socially isolated there is there's a lot of support there that needs to be offered and also a lot of support at key transition times so going from a nursery to a primary school, supporting the parents within that transition, because that's a really tricky one, as well as 
going to secondary school, another really tricky one, and into a post-16 setting, preparing the young people and supporting the families through that journey is really important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, th this show is brought to you in partnership with the Happy Confident Company, who I mentioned earlier, who provide clinically approved, ready to go wellbeing and mental health programs to help your pupils thrive in only 10 minutes a day. If you're interested in that, you can visit them at happyconfident.com to find out more. Um, Ryan, the thing I was going to ask you about next was like, which sort of leads in well from what Karina's just said, actually, which is about aspiration in the classroom so in your classroom are the, to put this bluntly are that you know what what who are the role models for the students in your classroom and what do they aspire to do and to be and has there ever been you know challenging or difficult situations for you where you know you're thinking can they do that when they're older um, yeah, so uh, I mean, at our school, we're, we're really fortunate that we've got um, some absolutely brilliant um, deaf role models who are who are members of staff, which is which is obviously really fantastic and yeah. uh, and something that we can draw upon a, a lot for the children. And you know, that's you know, we can, they can see that these people are doing fantastic things in their their career, and we really draw upon that. Um, for my current class, it's it's usual if I'm really honest. Um, we, we talk a lot about, you know, just as Karina said, what we want to do when we're older. You know, I, you know, as any teacher, would I talk about what I wanted to do when I was older, yeah. which was I wanted to be a pilot, I want, you know, things like that. I talk about what my friends do. I talk about careers, uh, opportunities, experiences, yeah. just lots of open discussion and things like that. Um, obviously, for, for those children that... Um, it, it might be more more tricky, shall we say, to to kind of get to those aspirations. Well, we we talk about what we'd need to get there. Yeah, you, just those same things that you would do in in a mainstream yeah. any, any mainstream setting. Obviously, for for me in terms of primary, it's a, a little trickier because I'm, I'm they're not they're you know they're all under, under ten years old. Yes. Um, but but certainly we talk about you know well, what you know what are the what are the values that the morals that we have to you know have to have to get there. And and we're really lucky at the minute, as as many people will know, we've got we've had this kind of flood recently mainly because of uh rose from who from eastenders um and, and strictly yeah. who's just been this absolute you know for certainly when i when i was doing my teacher the deaf qualification kind of five five years ago I, often i would try and look for kind of a deaf role model you know a really well-known deaf role model to talk about with the children you know and she has been genuinely an, an absolute beacon um of someone you can really you know, discuss with the children and, and who were, you know, even in her documentary that was that was on that she put on BBC last week. Yeah, very open about still the barriers that she's got, but how she's overcome them and things like that. So, you know, it, it's high aspiration for the children, absolutely, because you know, as I said, you know, early on in in, in the show, for for many deaf children, it's just language delay, um, and, and that can be overcome. It's not a cognitive issue; it, it's just no. language, um, and there's certainly no reason why deaf children can't can't aspire to do to do great things absolutely uh karina do you have anything to add to that on, on this idea of aspiration no i absolutely fully agree that it's it's something that we talk with our pupils about certainly in my role from a very early age we talk about what pupils are really really good at what do they love and we try and foster mm. that and nurture that and then we think about how they can be supported going forward. And with young children, these things are going to change in time. And that's wonderful because we can then look at the different things that they enjoy and we can widen it out. And if we start thinking about it and using, as you say, the example of Rose and other examples of people who have achieved great things, even though they have experienced difficulties. And I think that really helps to encourage our young people to believe that they can achieve whatever they want and it's interesting isn't it um karina in that you know technology is has developed at such a rate with with artificial intelligence and generative ai that actually a lot of the jobs that you know 20 years ago might have seemed very very difficult for um people to be able to do with this new technology 
it does open a lot of doors, doesn't it? I would presume to, you know, future careers and stuff. Absolutely. And the young people who have this technology are teaching me about it because they are the experts in it. So these new generation of hearing aids that our paediatric children have got with this Bluetooth technology that they can link to anything. We can add extra bits of tech to help them to link up to their their Xbox, their PlayStation, whatever is tech it is that they're wanting. But also things like speech to text apps, which are really, really useful yeah. for our young people. So there's lots of different um, technology and it is evolving and changing all of the time. And I think that's one of the things that we need to do as professionals is attempt to keep up with it in this very fast paced, changing environments. I'll ask you both this, but there's a comment here from Polly who says, teachers of the deaf are invaluable. Um, sadly, it is really hard for deaf people to get qualified. Um, I don't know whether, Polly, you mean teacher. It is it is difficult for teachers of the deaf to get qualified. I, th- I think that's what Polly means. Um, I don't know whether either of you want to sort of come in on that on that comment. If that's what if that's what Polly does mean. Yeah, I, I don't mind jumping in on that. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, it's really from from both a, a hearing perspective and, and a, a deaf perspective. Certainly, I, I was very lucky. Um, that I got a, a kind of scholarship towards some of my fees. I was single at the time um, with no children and no commitments. And so, and I, and I was working for a school that were really supportive. So I was able to kind of fund my master's and, you know, £10,000 and a loss of earnings for a couple, you know, by going to a 0.6 contract for that year. And it didn't impact me too massively now obviously if you're you know uh, further on in your career or you've got children you know etc dropping dropping down to part-time and paying ten thousand pounds or adding a, a postgraduate student loan is is a big expense so that that's really tricky and also you know i'm, I'm sure karina will agree we and, and you'll know this tom certainly in our setting we are crying out for for deaf people who are teachers. <laughs> That's um, actually what Polly, Polly's just followed up with a comment to say, oh, I, I meant we need more teachers of the deaf who are deaf. Absolutely. I, I cannot agree more. You know, as a hearing person, I, I really struggle sometimes with my my place in, in teaching deaf people within that deaf community because I'm not deaf, you know, and I, I'm massively aware of that. And I haven't got that that life experience to bring to that. And, and you know, as I've just mentioned, you know, some of our deaf members of staff are absolutely, they, I just cannot say how invaluable one of them is leaving in the summer. And I am genuinely, I'm not just saying this, devastated because she is just, I just think she's fantastic, you know, what she brings to the role. And we we just need to find a way of of getting deaf people um, through through a teaching qualification, um, so that we can get them into into our especially into our deaf schools, so that we've got you know positive deaf role models for deaf children. Yeah, I, I mean, Karina, I don't know whether you've got anything to add on those those comments from from Polly. No, I just wholeheartedly agree that as a hearing person, as a teacher of the deaf, I often feel a fraud. I I haven't experienced that world and who am I to to be giving advice? I do my absolute best, but I really believe that having more deaf people within education and particularly in teachers of the deaf will be absolutely essential. And I think the courses are changing and they're looking at encouraging more people to Mm. come onto the course by doing different roots into becoming teacher of the deaf and doing more training on the job which i fully support yeah because polly <laughs> polly's mess is saying my daughter is deaf and wanted to be a teacher of the deaf but didn't get qts um and she says that not enough modifications were made um so i, I don't know anything about the courses that are available or what modifications are made um but yeah it seems like a sort of valid point um, and one thing just for polly that i, I... I don't know if it's still the case, and I may have got this wrong, but it's certainly worth looking into. I'm, I am, for some reason, I've got in my head that at Manchester, um, you, I'm sure some people who were doing the course had experiences, say, higher level TAs, had experience in school, but could, you know, so that might be worth looking into. You might not necessarily have to have QTS for some parts of the course. 
don't quote me on that. It's just worth certainly worth looking into. And and certainly, you know, um, Helen Chilton, who runs the Manchester course, for example, and everyone I've come into contact with who run those courses, to be fair, are brilliant and really personable. So you can actually, you know, drop them a line or, or drop them a message and they'll discuss kind of your personal situation with you, I'm sure. Yeah, fantastic. Um, listen, I want to I wanna ask you both next. I'll start with Karina on this. How do you encourage learners who are deaf to express themselves? Um, so I think in primary school, in the mainstream, I have seen that our primary school teachers are really good at fostering those really close relationships with their pupils and particularly those deaf pupils after they've had a whole load of training from me, um, supporting the teachers to in- encourage them to talk to their deaf young people and to listen to them. Um, I also support, I also want young people to become really strong advocates for themselves. Um, And one of the ways I do that from a very early age is what I call purposeful sabotage. So um, if we're using technology, for example. Sounds interesting. Sounds like my relationship history, that Karina. (laughs) (laughs) Carry on. <laughs> so um, if I've got a young person who's got a radio aid, for example, as a class teacher, this would have been my worst nightmare to have to remember to mute myself constantly. So I, I encourage my my young people to to politely, but I give them permission to tell their teachers off. Um, and to do that, I encourage teachers to forget purposefully to mute or unmute. So we, we're encouraging those young people from a very early age to advocate for themselves to to tell their teachers off to to talk to their teachers to tell them what they need things like even talk to your young person about where they need to sit where is best for them to sit to be able to hear in that classroom yeah i can give advice but i'm not the deaf person and our even our really young children know where would be the best place for them to sit to be able to hear um i think we need to really carefully plan, and I've talked about it already, transition, our transition um, to secondary and to post-16. And in that time, we also need to really talk to our young learners about being able to express themselves, about when they go to secondary school, they're not going to have those close relationships that they've had with their primary teachers. So really supporting that and really doing a lot of work to prepare them for that change of setting and also to have sorry um some really trusted adults some mentors ideally deaf mentors um but if not some somebody who is has got that trusted relationship with their their person alongside their teacher the deaf but somebody else who is in school all of the time do you know what that's really good advice for me as well karina because i don't i you know with my classes at the moment that I have I probably should encourage them to uh to tell me more like when things aren't going you know when things can improve for them and that's yeah. something that you as a mainstream teacher you don't really do that do you? you don't you don't sort of sit there and think oh I want you know I want to be interrupted you know all the time with with can you do this can you do that but actually that that's sort of a really good point they are the experts we are the experts and having 30 children come and tell you all the time what you're not doing right is really not helpful as a teacher but for that one deaf child if there is something really easy it could be tweaked exactly and all different for them then we need to encourage that and we need to support those young people to develop those skills really early and it would be a lot earlier than other hearing peers would develop these skills. But for deaf young peers, I think we need to really focus on that really early. Yeah. Their ownership of their hearing loss. Um, Ryan, I don't know whether you've got anything to add to that, but I was also going to ask you next about um, curriculum and how you personally like adapt and change it and, and your lesson planning and how you go about that. Um. Yeah, so uh, just to echo what Karina said, really, yeah. it, it was very much that, that I think that close relationships thing and, you know, really empowering the, the children by building relationships with, and trust um, within them is really, really important. Certainly something I found 
um, to get our, our children to express themselves as being quite, you know, uh, professionally uh, vulnerable and discussing things that I found hard and our, our staff at our school are absolutely fantastic at that, at being really open themselves with the children because that just fosters that that openness within within the children themselves, which is useful. In terms of curriculum, our school have, have gone on a bit of a journey um, recently, really, um, especially in primary, well, across the school, really. I, I, and the mantra we're, we're really, you know, is high aspiration, but also doing less better. I, and, and that means that, you know, we, we try a, and really offer that full curriculum to the children. So, you know, tomorrow morning, my children will do music. We have an absolutely fantastic music teacher that comes in. And even the children who are profoundly deaf with no um, no amplification at all, they take part and absolutely love the music lessons. But yeah, we certainly, in terms of curriculum, we we try to try to do less. And by less, I don't mean very little. I mean just a little bit less, but really well um, to make sure the children understand it. But we also, you know, are, are comfortable in our own skin in terms of, of saying, actually, you know, recently we, we, we've done this in terms of summer play coming up this week. Um, you know, we're saying we need more time. We've just got to take our foot off the gas, off the curriculum and come off that that curriculum treadmill that sometimes, you know, certainly, you know, I, I've I've experienced when you're in mainstream, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Karina, I know your context is is slightly different to, to Ryan's in the sense you're sort of in and out of lots of different situations. But are there any sort of planning principles that you have in your, you know, in your head whenever you're thinking about that? So it's more about the advice that I give to yeah. our staff. Um, one of the things for a mainstream pupil is that pre and post tutoring going into a lesson already understanding that new vocabulary or that new concept that's being taught and going back to what Ryan said a while ago is we need to take those three steps backwards to ensure all of that prior learning has been understood before we start to take one step forward so that pre-tutoring is absolutely vital um yeah I also think and I also really advocate with the teachers that I support is using that open-ended question ensuring that deaf young person has understood the learning by that formative assessment by questioning and making sure that they've had that time with the teacher where they can share their learning to make sure that learning journey they're going on is in the right direction and not going in completely the wrong direction and then I think in a mainstream classroom the other things that are really important to think about is creating that learning environment which is a listening environment so making sure class staff think about reducing their background noise what are they going to do with a deaf young person who's involved in group work and paired work when we've got 30 children talking in the classroom how are they going to facilitate that where if anywhere could the deaf child go with their partner or their group to have that conversation in a quieter area yeah so it's thinking about that learning and listening environment as well yeah. as thinking about how they're accessing the curriculum yeah um ryan in terms of like your classroom setting because obviously you teach in a special school for the deaf um what for you would be the optimal listening and lip reading setup for a classroom um i'm sure it's probably similar for, to what karina would say so yeah well lit um acoustically um, optimal um, so you, you might have some um, acoustic paneling on the wall just to soak up some of that background noise um, you know obviously deaf children at the front so for, for me we try uh, my room's not ideal this year just because it's a, a, a bit of an odd shaped room but we try and make sure that um, all the children can really see me well luckily I'm six foot five so that that does help yeah, um, you are a very tall man yeah, um, the teacher standing still is absolutely essential, which is something I had to get used to because I used to wander around the classroom quite a lot talking. Oh, sugar, standing I never even front. thought of that. Yeah, standing still, just so children can access your lip pattern. Things like making sure that um, the children, you know, obviously sometimes you might have your board against um, your, your interactive whiteboard, certainly if it's one on wheels that's kind of... Um, you know, backed onto a window with a window behind it. And obviously if the children are looking at you and the sun's blaring through the window, um, 
they, they can't see you very well because the sun, sun's shining straight in their eyes. So it's it's little things like that that just making sure that both the visual um, conditions and the listening conditions are optimal at, at all times for the children, really. And, and just... Oh, yeah, go on, I was going to say, like, resourcing, like, you know, like, PowerPoints and stuff like that. I mean, is, is there anything you do particularly with those? Yeah, and certainly. Um, so, for a good example is, is probably one from today. So, so our primary children are doing their school play. Um, so we've we, we've obviously written that, but for a lot of our children, um, as an example, it's all about go, uh, visiting the King in London. Well, some of the things that we're talking about, some of the children don't really understand what that is. So we've then had to convert that into a, a story, and then. Um, Karina mentioned AI, but using AI to make a, a picture version of that story so the children can see it, to understand it, to then learn it. So it's all the time just breaking it down, making it visible, you know, yeah. um, really making it clear, really, 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 really clear. Well, it'd be worth mentioning here, you know, if you think about AI, you know, you've got text, you've got text to text AI, you've got text to video or, um, and visual AI, but you've also got visual to text ai so the possibilities there for students to um, have images that they've created um, or images that they've drawn themselves and then to be able to generate text from that 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 possibility now exists um, for students to be able to enter instructions to create images is a possibility so there's quite a few options there with AI that definitely are going to be really helpful for, for deaf students and totally agree. I mean, the classroom layout stuff is important. I wonder whether, you know, like um, chairs and tables, is there anything with that? You know, because the classics are like rows, pods, horseshoe. You know, is there anything with in, in a deaf context that, that's best for them? Presumably pods isn't good because they'd then be looking at each other so there's more distraction. Yeah, absolutely. Pod, pods aren't the best, so so you know you'll certainly find in our our place that a lot of a lot of the classes are in are in horseshoe, or or if if they can't do a horseshoe for whatever reason because of the room or whatever, they're in kind of rows or, or angled so the children can all see. Um, certainly, Karina will probably have said this to lots of the schools she's gone into. Little things like um, you know. I think what people sometimes don't quite understand with hearing aids and cochlear implants is they don't, you know, as someone who wears glasses, they don't make hearing um, 2020 like glasses make you vision 2020. Um, and hearing aids are just a big microphone, uh, effectively, that pick up all the noise and they can be absolutely horrendous to listen to. And so that background noise of a, a charged chair dragging along the, the floor or someone rattling a pencil around a pencil part, little things like that. Yeah. Can, can actually, that's what they might be hearing over everything else. So, you know, simple things of, of trying to, you know, soften the furnishings in terms of, you know, even if it, some of the chairs are on a hard floor, just putting cheap, cheap alternative, cut a hole in the tennis ball, chuck it, chuck it on the bottom of the chairs, just so they're not scraping on the floor. Um, you know, keeping the door closed, you know, so that you're not hearing the, the hand drive from the toilets down the corridor because that's that deaf child, that's all they might hear. And, and again, Karina's, uh, Karina's mentioned it a few times in terms of um, equipment, but the radio aid systems, which is the kind of microphone that you'll see quite a lot of teachers who've got a, um, a child with hearing loss in their class around their neck, um, it, like a microphone thing that they have around their neck um, that connects via Bluetooth to the the child's hearing aids or cochlear implants, that that thing is unbelievably vital um, to that child because you're effectively, you know, we're all quite familiar with AirPods or, or Bluetooth headphones now. You're effectively giving that child a, a set of Bluetooth headphones to your directly to your voice, which yeah, you know, it just is so important, especially in that mainstream setting. Yeah, Karina, I'm sure you've got a lot to add on this because this is probably a big part of your job, isn't it, to advise... It teachers on how to go about the classroom setup and stuff so what do you want to add Absolutely. I think Ryan has pretty much covered it all I did want to pick up on one thing um, that's been said in the chat by Polly the radio aids are fabulous but yes the stories that we hear from our young people about the conversations that they have overheard are so curlingly awful so um ensuring that our our staff really do understand the implications of using a radio aid 
and what could be heard with a range of 25 metres going through doors and walls. Um, I mean, it is, I have to say, it is difficult for someone to get used to that um, because I've done it, um, you know, left it on and whatever, and someone said, you've got to unmute that. Um, So it is something you've sort of got to train the staff into, isn't it? It is my absolute worst nightmare. I, yeah, and, I, and sometimes it, it is probably just going to happen, isn't it? Of I course mean, it is. It's going to happen. I think one of the things that I often do is with a mainstream class, after I've spoken to the deaf child in the class, together, them and me, give um, a talk. We do a lesson on being deaf and about deaf awareness. And one of the things we talk about is the radio aid and reminding the teacher if they are talking when it's not muted, when their chest is not flashing red to, to mute it. So giving everybody in the class that understanding, it's a shared team effort. Um, Definitely. And I think that's really important. Um, what you've said about AI has completely blown my mind. It's not something I'm completely familiar with. And I know it's something that my young people will be sharing with me and telling me all about. Um, in a very simple level, and something we can do in the classrooms is where possible use subtitles. Yeah. You're not only is it good for the deaf young person but actually there's research to suggest that if we use um subtitles with young children it really helps to improve their reading so it's a win-win all round there is actually software available now as well where now you're going to blow my mind again aren't you possibly i don't know actually <laughs> i think you'll have i think you'll have seen or heard of these ones but essentially you can let, let's say for example there are five pods in the room like mm-hmm. pod areas where the children are sat. Yeah. Um, you get five devices. So you put each device onto each table and then um, each one of those devices picks up the voice of anyone on that table. Um, and each person on the table has a different microphone. And then what happens is, and they're color coded. So what then happens is it will auto subtitle onto a board or a wall what every single person in the class is saying to each other does that make sense it does that's really great like live Mm -hmm. so um so like yeah so that's that i've seen that demoed actually um at the bet show and um yeah it was really really cool so it's sort of like it's basically live subtitling for the class yeah that's actually what it was um anyway i want to i want to ask you next about um how and i'll start with ryan on this one how how do you help to develop positive deaf identity uh well, yeah we we as, as i mentioned we've got we've got brilliant staff who, who are deaf so that that is a massive yeah you know, that really helps we do a we do you know it's built into our curriculum we do a lot of our history topics are based on or our art topics and so for example my history topic this term and my art topic are both based on um for example my history at the minute is based on um the development of of hearing devices since the 17th century oh, really yeah and, and um wow that's and, so cool yeah, and then deaf art. Um, so we're, um, we're looking at two deaf artists from America for our art topic this term. Um, so there's also, con- and this is a good one for a study, is that guy who is a model. Is it something DeMarco in America? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, DeMarco. yeah. yeah. And he's like a deaf, it? Yeah, he's like a deaf. Federico, no, not, not Federico. Can't remember his name. Um, I know DeMarco. what you mean because my, my, my partner has shown me him. <laughs> somehow she found him let's just say that so um yeah um, so, so yeah we, we and it's it's a lot of open discussion you know at our, our place we have um deaf role models um up on the walls now we we talk a lot about aspirations uh, and what deaf people have achieved um what they've overcome we make we make uh, we, we obviously take part in, in um, deaf awareness week. We have you know deaf awareness challenges. Um, lots of you know we do lots of um, we make sure the children access lots of opportunities to to um, share their 
share their um, signing skills. Uh, you know, we've got some some of the secondary uh, pupils that you'll know, Tom, who are who are uh, out at another school this evening um, yeah. doing a music concert. Um, I was at a music concert for for schools in our area, all the schools in our area, a couple of weeks ago. So we make the children proud. You know, we try and make them really proud of who they are. Um, and like I said previously as well, we're so fortunate at our place, um, because all the children are deaf and, and they they feel uh, a familiarity, uh, a kind of they've got that peer group that makes them proud to be who they are, which is really, really lovely. That's amazing. Um, Karina, do you have anything to add on this in terms of developing positive deaf identity? I think for young people in mainstream, that is a lot more challenging where they're the only deaf person in their school. Yeah, I can imagine, yeah. And I think that's something that we as peripatetic teachers the deaf are very conscious of and we really do try and support. So as I've already said in our authority, we do encourage our young people to come to our social opportunities so they can meet other deaf people in the area. Yeah. We have some brilliant charity partners who provide weekly meetup, um, monthly meetups for our families and those are so well attended. There is such a need, a growing need for this. And I really wish it's something that we could develop further. You think, um, I don't know if you saw the the um, Rose Ailing Alice documentary on BBC, but one of the, that conversation stood out to me when, when it was the one of, I think it was a mum or dad or whoever it was, had said, you know, we don't want you to hang around too much with other deaf people. Um, and then she was sort of, uh challenging that but understood the methodology behind it because i'm guessing there is that thing of like oh we don't we want we we want them to be in inverted commas normal do you know what i mean and and therefore keep keep them does that make sense like that's basically what the documentary was saying it is and it's really difficult for parents it's it's something that that they really really struggle with and that's something we really support um one thing we do do for our families who've experienced a new diagnosis is we have a weekly um top session so that all of these families can come together and, and be together so i think for those families that need that kind of support that want that kind of support we we offer as much as as possible and that's one of the roles of a peripatetic teacher of the deaf um is to try and support those young people in mainstream to see that there are other young people who are deaf who are within their local area um, I think something else that we do to develop that positive deaf identity, the NDCS, I've got some really good um, resources available. One resource is the Deaf, deaf Healthy Minds resource, okay. um, which is fabulous. And for the older people, Deaf Works Everywhere, um, supporting that transition and that idea of what are we going to do in adulthood, what support is available. And that's something that's in my authority we've taken on and we do a lot of that support going forwards. Um, we've spoken about it loads today, but developing those self-advocacy skills, being positive, this is who I am. I know what I need. This is what I need you to do. So developing that and trying to find deaf mentors so that we have got those deaf people within our local community or within a wider space like Rose to be able to look up to. Um, and finally, for some of our deaf young people, um, using the buzz, the NDCS buzz, where they can link together is also being really good. But what's that? Sorry. The buzz, B U double Z. Okay. What is it? Um, it's an online forum for deaf young people to go on to. So, sort of eight through to 16. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a, a safe space for deaf young people to chat. But it, there's also a forum where they're trying to develop policy, trying to um, engage in campaigns that the NDCS are running. Um, deaf Young People's Forum that meet together. So it's it's empowering deaf young people to stand up and have a voice on a national level, as well as have a safe space to chat to each other. That sounds, sounds brilliant. Um, a good segue for me to just mention one of our sponsors tonight, which is Pearson EdXL, and they've got a new student-centred French, German and Spanish GCSE. 
Um, so if you're interested in finding out more about that, you can visit go.pearson.com forward slash MFL. Um, the thing that makes this unique is that it's rooted in learned language knowledge. Um, all the assessments are transparent, they're accessible, and they allow all students to showcase their language skills through inclusive and relatable content. Um, so whether you're an MFL teacher or not, even if you just work in any school and you're looking at introducing any MFL qualifications, then definitely check out go.pearson.com forward slash MFL. Um, Ryan, I want to ask you next about um, the differentiation. Uh, we've sort of talked about this already, but I-, I wondered whether maybe we could talk a little bit more about um, differentiation and how that uh, comes into play when delivering lessons. Um, so, for example, one of the things I read was about the use of voice um, and how, like, the tone and the speed and all these other things. So I don't know whether you want to talk about how you differentiate just from a purely, like, the fundamentals of teaching perspective. I'm not talking about worksheets or PowerPoints or whatever. I'm talking about you and your delivery and your presence in the classroom. Um, yeah, um, a, a, a really good example at the minute is, is so, so this year my class are kind of mixed, um, quite a few who've got cochlear implants who are quite oral and some that are more reliant on sign than others. But one in particular, one child in particular, their hearing is, um, their hearing, they've got profound hearing loss and, and their, their, um, device, their hearing devices aren't, aren't aren't working particularly well for them at the minute long story short and so that basically means that my my input changes massively because i'm i'm constantly you know i'm talking and so i'm doing what we'd call sign supported english so that means i'm I'm talking but i'm signing at the same time and that means that I'm, i'm trying to give high quality language input to those children that are more reliant say on my speech but also trying to give um that input in sign language to to those children that need need that sign so that that's always a, a massive consideration and, and for me you know um you know uh, you know sign language is its own language that's really important you know that that question that we, i always get you know, when people say oh i'm a teacher for the deaf and people say oh you know you, you know sign language well it, it's not not as simple as that because you know to be to be a fluent signer you know it'd be like living you've got to be living in a signing world all the time you know and uh, and frankly you know if you were fluent in spanish you'd probably be living in spain and you know i come home and i talk to my partner and and you know no, no one else i know signs so if that makes sense yeah. so, so, so you how know, did but, you learn it you must have taken you ages well I've, I, i'm still learning i'm still learning yeah. you know we're really fortunate at our school we have a a, 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 a deaf tutor who teaches the children but also kind of help you know teaches the staff as well so i'm learning i'm constantly learning from the children and i have to um you know back to fundamentals i you know if we if there's a piece of vocabulary obviously all my a lot of my teaching is very uh, i'm trying to kind of constantly as i'm planning think about what vocabulary do i think the children are going to struggle with and i have to go back at, you know i have to look up the vocabulary in, in sign before i teach it so that's really changed the way i teach um and and certainly it's it all for, for me at school it, it it comes down to language it comes down to the language level of the children so you know sometimes we we teach um especially like i mentioned earlier you know as we're coming towards the end of the term we're doing play together um between you know several classes together well obviously some of the children in the other classes um who are a similar age aren't as high ability or their language level isn't quite as high as say my class for example so it's it's about how i um get the, the same message across but in, in a simplified way so it's just it's really teaching to the to the needs really getting down to the nitty-gritty of the needs of those children all the time really thinking about it all the time how am i going to get across and what's what's the goal here um rather than you know obviously it's not activity it's 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 the aim it's the learning aim over the activity um a lot of the time if that makes sense yeah it does um karina again i'm guessing you talk to a lot of mainstream teachers about this but what what advice do you give them when it comes to sort of differentiation and stuff like that there's there's a lot of different advice but a lot of what's already been said um this this idea in the mainstream of pre and post tutoring which i've already um spoken about in depth also 
providing supporting materials to that deaf child to en enable them to remember what's and to remem remind them of the, the pre-learning. So visual supporting material, word banks, all of those kinds of things, which are really, really useful, again, for all children, but particularly for those deaf children. Um, yeah. as we get older, so those older pupils, possibly giving pupils the PowerPoints or the lesson notes prior to the lesson so that they can have a look at the first and also not to expect our older children and our older young people to write lesson notes and listen at the same time. It's impossible. So it's making yeah. sure that those mainstream teachers have got a really good deaf awareness um, and speak to the pupils as well and use all of this technology that we've now got to support that learning environment to ensure that they have that equal access as well as the usual differentiation that good quality classroom teachers use. Um Karina, I'll, I'll stick with you on this, but what do you think is the most challenging thing about being a teacher of the deaf? And and what is the what is the most common sort of mistake or maybe uh, misconception or thing that teach? And when I say teachers of the deaf, I mean anyone who teaches a deaf person, right? So not just qualified teachers of the deaf. I mean anybody who teachers deaf person what are what are the most common misconceptions and mistakes that you've come across in your time i think there are there are quite a few teacher position where teachers teaching from so we've already spoken about the need to stand still rather than walking yes. around the classroom or i was really bad as a primary school teacher at writing on the board when we're doing shared writing and talking at the same time so i'm talking to the board which is useless. So we yeah. think about that because teachers are time, they're, they're so conscious of the time they're trying to get as much done as possible, but taking time to stop, to talk, and then to go and do what you need to do. Um, being aware of where a deaf person sits in the classroom, um, sometimes they haven't thought about that, and I see a deaf child at the back of the classroom, and my hands are on my head and I'm thinking you know, we, we've got to support this deaf child and we've got to to make some positive changes for them um and I think having not having the expectations we want our deaf young people to have equal access and so we expect them to be able to achieve in line with their peers and that's really important. So being creative and making sure that we're doing absolutely everything to support that. Yeah, I, I, that's that's. I mean, you've you've hit the nail on the head. Really, there on a number of issues um, that can come about. I mean, do you think like because um, some of that again comes back to what you said earlier about uh, Karina about like the confidence thing, doesn't it? Because some presumably some deaf children want the sort of that temptation for them I guess to to hide away or to shrink back or to not sort of say to the teacher look I, I want to do this or I want to do that do you know what I mean absolutely and in all classes we've got those pupils who don't want to to shine a light on themselves and that's where relationships are really really important having a relationship with their teacher of the deaf so if they don't want to speak to their class teacher they don't want to stand out they've actually then got somebody to advocate for themselves. I also think, and it's not something I've spoken about yet, is the relationship with the class teacher and the parents is absolutely vital. Our deaf young people may not want to say the issues that they're experiencing in the classroom, but they may go home and they may tell their parent everything. And then it's for the teacher to take time to listen to the parent and to work with the parents about how we can support that and make those changes so it's about for me it's about relationships and about having those positive relationships with all people um ryan what what do you find the most challenging thing about being a teacher of the deaf in a, in a deaf school um so in a deaf school it is that constant um sometimes you know you, i i i think the children are going to understand something and i find that they don't um, and we we have to go back and that's you know that's a challenge at times because you know it, it just it just throw your plans and and what you think you're going to get done up in the air quite quickly and you can find yourself 
kind of going, I've done some work on this or spend quite a bit of time on something and go, actually, that was a bit of a waste. Well, not a waste of time, but that was, uh, you know, I need to go backwards now. Um, certainly, and that, that can be really tricky. And, and um, I think certainly as well, in, in a deaf school, one thing, I, I, you know, I, I know that we find difficult is sometimes, you know, we've got children who come from, from further distances um so so that relationship with families is is tricky because we don't see the families at school every day certainly from a primary perspective whereas you know in a mainstream you, you will see parents or or carers regularly at pick up or, or drop off we don't have that so that communication can be can be tricky at times especially uh, you know um with our 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 um families who might be eal or etc because everything's got to be done um via text email etc uh, certainly just to pick up on what karina was saying as well um i know some some um peripatetic colleagues of mine certainly I, i've heard this lots of times I, I don't know if you would agree that deaf children quite often will be the, those children who are lovely you know quiet aren't causing the teacher lots of issues and they might sit quite quietly at the back and nod along and you know Karina mentioned open-ended questions and if a teacher keeps asking that deaf child closed you know closed questions and they you know they've got two options yes or no or whatever and they they keep getting it right they might not actually be <laughs> realize what they're missing out on because you know they're, they're not causing that many issues and that therefore they're not getting the attention they probably need um, which can be really really tricky at times. Karina, I don't know whether you want to sort of. Yeah, I absolutely agree that sometimes and and no, quite often, our our young people do they they want to they want to be seen as like their hearing peers. They want to fit in, and so they will not step up and they will not advocate for themselves when they haven't heard something or when they need they haven't understood something. So I absolutely agree that that's one of the reasons that I think our deaf young people don't achieve in line with their peers is that the the teachers assume that because they've got their hearing technology and um, we've already used the analogy and I use it all the time as well that it's like it's not like me putting my glasses on and I get my 20-20 vision hearing aids are not that that's not what they do so teachers wrongly assume that that's what happens and so it's about educating that staff and about having regular times to support staff to train staff and to make sure that when you've got new staff that come in part way through the year you do that training again and again to make sure that everybody's got that really good deaf awareness do you, i wanted to sort of touch now on like working with the parents and stuff um again like ignorantly i so probably if you'd have asked me like a year ago or something um you know are the parents of deaf children often deaf themselves i'd have probably said yeah um but but i don't i mean do you guys know what the percentages are like on that yeah go on karina you probably i'll let you go <laughs> um i think and please correct me if i'm wrong i think 90 percent of deaf children are born to hearing families yeah that's it's it's some built somewhere between 90 but somewhere between 90 and 95%. So the vast and majority. That, do you know what? And I just think that is so interesting because I, I, if you went out into the street now and asked people that, I don't think they'd say that. I genuinely don't. It'd be a really interesting social experiment because I, I think a lot of people would presume that they're not. Do you know what I mean? Because think... they... Sorry, when I did my training course... Um five six years ago I honestly could not believe that as well and that is exactly the impression I had I thought deaf children were born predominantly yeah. to deaf families and I've got examples where we've got families that have got several siblings and yeah. then have a deaf sibling so it, it's very very interesting yeah I, I you know as I say it's something that sort of has really surprised me um, like I say, I'd, I'd have said 90% the other way, you know, a year ago, if you'd have asked me, um, I'd have said, you know, 90% just from, just from like, I guess like your deductions, 
you sort of think, oh, yeah, you know, like if it's genetic or whatever, then, you know, the parents would. So I was going to ask you both, like, how do you, is there any, are there any particular things with working with the parents of, um, of a deaf child that you think are particularly sort of specific? Um, Ryan, I don't know whether you want to start on that. Um, I, I, I think it, it's it's making sure that the the and I think Karina will probably say the same is is it, in all the time is making sure that their child is in a language rich environment and and that is for all modes of communication, whether their child is a is oral or is is a signer and you know as as we keep saying it, it's it's you know these children they need language more than than hearing children because they've got that language delay so you know commonly you know it, it, there's research that says sometimes that um parents will reduce their language input for deaf children because they don't think they can hear them well actually that's you know arguably the wrong thing to do especially in light of the, the the technology these children have these days or um in light of the availability and again especially because of people like rose Aylin ellis um of sign language and sign language courses you know the importance of things like that giving these children access to language and talking to them all the time loads of book talk lots of discussion about what's going on around them description talk 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 all the time is is really really uh oh yeah, really really important uh karina i don't know whether you've got anything to add there we're working with parents particularly any specific things i wholeheartedly agree with what has just been said that language rich environment giving talking all the time whether you're at the shops whether you're um cooking a meal whatever it might be that talk i think from my point of view we support parents at the very start of their journey at diagnosis so also it's about listening to parents and it's about supporting parents on the journey that they wish to take and empowering them to be able to be confident to make those decisions I think as well in those very early stages, talking about choices and then supporting choices and supporting parents to be advocates for their young people, particularly when they are in those early stages and they haven't got a voice for themselves and supporting the parents to enable their deaf young person as they go through their journey to be an independent, proud deaf young person. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um we're coming towards the end now. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you both, like, if somebody who's sort of like me, who's maybe just coming into it or just maybe they're training into it or whatever and they want to they wanna do it, they want to work with deaf children, they're, they're interested in it and they want to do well at it. Um, so if we were to say, you know, how, how can you be a successful teacher of the deaf? And we were to sort of try and ask you to give your maybe two or three top tips or bits of advice or, or nuggets of wisdom, um, what would they be? So I'll start with, with Ryan on this one. Um, as we, I think as with most things in life, um, a really open mind um, is, is absolutely essential. Um, an appreciation of, uh, as Karina's mentioned, of listening to people and their experiences um, uh, and certainly, again, this is this is why I think the Rose Ailing Ellis documentary that was on last week, she nailed it because it's about appreciating the deaf community, mm. um, modalities of language, respecting sign language as its own language, respecting um, oral, oral language or sign support. It is, it's that respect for that whole deaf community and not being... Um, not being too top down with your opinions, certainly uh, as a teacher of the deaf, as a hearing teacher of the deaf as well, um, is really, really important, I would say. Brilliant. Um, Karina? So I've come up with four things, I'm sorry. Oh, here we go. Right. I think the first thing, and it's exactly what Ryan has said, is about listening. Listening to everybody who is involved in the deaf world. Um, and learning from them would be my second thing, taking every single opportunity you can to learn um, and to also take a step back and just to watch, quietly watch, because from watching you can do so much learning. And then finally talking to deaf people 
deaf young people, their families, and embracing that whole journey. Yeah, spot on. Spot on. I mean, is there any advice um, from, like, the classroom sense in terms of, like, teaching and learning? Is there anything you, you, you might throw in there in terms of, like, you know, your top sort of thing that you you would say to a, a teacher from a teaching and learning perspective? My top thing would be to mute your radio aid. Ha! Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and from, from a teacher's point of view, I think my top tip would be talk to the young people, talk to their families, and they are the experts in their hearing loss and their hearing journey. Those are the people that you need to speak to and seek advice it's it's a world that not a lot of teachers are lucky enough to get to explore um, and go on the journey with the young people. So seek advice from your teacher of the deaf, from your families and embrace it and learn from it. And you will make mistakes and you can laugh at those mistakes because the children will laugh with you. Brilliant. Fantastic. Um Listen, a massive thanks to both of you. It's been it's been great, um, really good conversation. Um, I've learned a massive amount from you both, so huge appreciation from me. This will be available as a podcast if you're listening back to it via Twitter Spaces. Then thank you for staying with us for the show. Um, if you're listening back to it as a podcast, thank you to you too. Um, it's available on Spotify, Apple Podcast, Google Play, TuneIn Radio, and all the other ones um, that you can possibly get a podcast on. Um, this has been the Late Show on Teachers Talk Radio. As I mentioned earlier, tonight's show is sponsored by Pearson MFL and the Happy Confident Company. If you want to check out both of those wonderful companies and what they deliver, then you can do so by visiting Pearson dot com forward slash mfl oh sorry go dot pearson dot com forward slash mfl and happy confident dot com uh, i'll be back a week today discussing labor's education policy proposals which have been released in the last over the last sort of trickle through in the last week so i'll be back a week today 7 30 p.m to discuss that with a panel uh looking at the the different uh policies that they are proposing to introduce uh thank you very much and we will see you again very soon on ttr you've been listening to teachers talk radio tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org we look forward to hearing from you next time on teachers talk radio